Thank you all for coming to the UPC ISS seminar. Uh, today we have Dr. George Bolas with us um, from the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering uh, at UConn. He's an assistant professor currently. Um, he is a process design expert and he's a winner of prestigious NSF Career Award. And also he is a uh, winner of ASC PRF DNI Award. He is, uh, he received his BE and PhD degrees from the Aristotle University of uh, Thessaloniki. Is that right? <laughs> that's right. And that's in Greece. And then he worked as a postdoctoral research associate at MIT. Dr. Bolas, he is currently a director of Process Design Simulation and Optimization Laboratory, uh, which performs research on system intensification and processes that addresses the growing energy crisis and the environment impact of energy production. His current research portfolio includes model-based and experimental analysis of process and chemical looping combustion with an emphasis on the scale-up uh, of existing pilot plants to power plant capacities, experimental and theoretical studies of biomass spiralysis, gasification, and catalyst deactivation during bio biomass catalytic process. Fisher top synthesis and model-based design of aircraft cabin, uh, cabin air and temperature control. And today is going to talk to us about model derived chemical looping system designs. And with that, George. Did you do composites as well? Composites? No. Okay. Not yet. You never know. Um, so thank you very much for the kind introduction. You actually saved me a couple of slides. <laughs> so uh, uh, what? Uh, I will discuss today is a new process that we came up with using pure model. But uh, before I start, as you said, I did my PhD in bachelor's in, uh, in Greece, and I went to MIT for a few years and a half to do a postdoc on uh, uh, process optimization and um, uh, thermodynamic optimization. Uh, I have uh, nine students, graduate students in my group, and uh, I'm not sitting in the right place. And I work with several undergraduates. Uh, what we do is, uh, we're doing two things. My background is uh, on uh, process uh, modeling and optimization, and uh, a lot of that involves catalysis since we're chemical engineers. So uh, I will be talking about this half of uh, my research that day that uh, focuses mostly on process modeling and optimization and dynamic sensitivity analysis. Uh, as an introduction, we uh, I work on chemical looping. I will explain very briefly what this is, and I will try to uh, focus more on the systems aspects of uh, chemical looping and, and what, what we do. Uh, <coughs> chemical looping is a process for CO2 capture, and uh, this is a very nice figure for the introduction of the problem, uh, generally speaking, where uh, this is an environmental model of uh, the Earth as it is right now as it would look like if we cool it by 4C, and as it, as it would look like if we, pull it, if we warm it up by uh, 2.5C, which is the predicted, uh, predicted temperature increase due to global warming and climate change for the next, um, after the next 10 years or so. So there would be a point that would be Miami would be in Alaska and so on if we keep warming the, uh, the planet. And the major driving force for the global warming is uh, CO2. It's uh, the anthropogenic CO2. And the concept for chemical looping is that we capture CO2. And um, the argument there is uh, this is the real step in the whole process that uh, is the one that's very expensive, both in terms of energy and economically. And many people ask, OK, let's say you capture it. What do you do? The EPA and the DOE have been uh, analyzing that for quite a few years. And this shows just the United States and all the uh, deposits or the empty depleted uh, uh, reservoirs and uh, basins that uh, we can uh, use to pressurize CO2 and just dead it back to, uh, to the uh, inside the earth. So the overall concept, at least as it stands right now, is that if we manage to somehow capture CO2 efficiently, there are solutions for what we can do with that. My uh, approach to uh, discussing this as a joke is that we can make tons of beverages and coke and uh, request <laughs> people to just drink that. So what happened in 2002 when this uh, actually started becoming more and more an important problem, the uh, National Academy uh, started uh, all the process that are proposed for CO2 capture, and they came up with uh, 
uh, generic plot that looks like that, where we show the uh, uh, they show the presented the time to commercialization or TRL and the cost or the benefit or the efficiency of CO2 capture. And what they did is they put chemical looping up there and uh, so showing that this is the most immature process at this point or was the most immature process back in 2008, but at the same time is the one that's most promising out of all the processes for uh, efficient and uh, energetically and economically efficient uh, CO2 capture. And as a result, what happens when the National Academy is done, but it does that, is a ton of money was invested in research in chemical looping, and uh, these are all new pilot plants that were built since that, after 2008, 2009. Chemical looping is research that's been uh, carried out mostly, or at least was started mostly in, in Europe, and uh, Chalmers University in Sweden, and then uh, it went on in uh, Korea, uh, Alstom, uh, is studying it, and um, uh, Germany, Spain, Austria, there are very few uh, uh, countries that don't have a power plant right now. We don't, here in Europe. Yeah. So what, Ohio has something? Hmm? Ohio has something in the market? Ohio, uh, Professor Ellis Fang from Ohio has uh, uh, an over $20 million investment from the DOE and the state and has uh, from, uh, started with smaller pilot scale, started with asthma simulations actually, then went to smaller uh, plants, pilot scale plants, and now they're building a quite large pilot plant to yeah. demonstrate their... Uh, their uh, Professor Fine is working with uh, Babcock work on scale Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So also has two passages as we discussed. One is metal oxide best, that's in Europe. Actually, uh, also has up to, uh, so far has uh, one megawatt thermal scale. It's not 15 kilowatt. This is from, a, this is not mine. This is from a review paper that was published yeah, it's not in 2014. In so also here in Connecticut, and Connecticut people should be proud of that. We have three megawatt thermal. Okay, great. See that? Three megawatt thermal facility. It's in Windsor, Connecticut, next to the airport, not far from the airport. So, what is chemical looping to, not to the Alston people, but the, uh, <laughs> chemical looping is a clever concept, is uh, how chemical engineers can be smart sometimes uh, to separate uh, CO2 from nitrogen uh, after combustion without ever separating. The concept is that uh, uh, we use two reactors instead of one for the combustion of uh, hydrocarbon, and uh, the first reactor will just oxidize a me metal, so uh, metal comes in, in the first reactor, it gets oxidized, we send that metal to a second reactor, and the oxygen of that metal is used to oxidize any, any hydrocarbon. During that oxidation of the hydrocarbon, or any fuel, during that oxidation, the metal is being reduced and you send it back. Uh, this step is highly exothermic, this step is most often endothermic, or sometimes, depending on the metal uh, oxide, is, uh, can be exothermic. The overall uh, heat released by the two-step process is the same as just combusting the, uh, the fuel. And what we get from uh, what we call a reducer, the second reactor is just pure CO2 and water. So you uh, condense the water and you have a pure stream of CO2 uh, to store it, to bury it, to do whatever you want. And the overall benefit of that is that compared to, compared to other processes like cryogenic distillation or uh, ammonia, uh, uh, absorption and so on, uh, there is no high energy intensive step in chemical looping. It's just the process. Um, so that's why it was right at the top of the National Academy's uh, analysis. And, uh, My brother was doing something in fluid days with combustion way back. <laughs> well, you see, you see, you see later <laughs> fluid days back, but uh, this presentation is definitely not about fluid days. Um, so what we have uh, uh, done, uh, this there has been an explosion in publications in my group since uh, September or something, it was the first one in 2013, is we analyzed, uh, studied a lot the uh, kinetics, first the kinetics of nickel oxide with methane, and it's not the most practical application of chemical looping from the Alstom perspective, but was the one that uh, we can actually, we, can, we could use, has been studied a lot, so we had a lot of experimental data to work with as we were starting. And um, uh, we take, took it all the way up to actually uh, proposing a new concept for a reactor of uh, chemical looping that I will be discussing today. Uh, this is actually an NSF uh, 
the again my MSF career award and an answer grant and the big concept uh, behind this or to have at least until the end of the process is that we'll come up with an entirely new concept for scaling up uh, uh, processes. So the, the dream is that we'll one day take the very small fixed bed reactor that we have in, a, in a, my laboratory and it's really, really small and we scale it up all the way to the power plant or all the way back to up to the commercial unit uh, using dynamic sensitivity analysis, studying that as an optimal experimental design problem and trying to eliminate all the disturbances or the unexpected errors that may come using uh, the model and the dynamics, uh, the dynamic predictions of the model. To start that, and what we'll discuss today a little bit is, I'm pretty sure that no one will build a one billion dollars a plant based on uh, my small fixed bed reactor in my model. So uh, uh, we, the plan is to actually work a little bit on scaling down existing processes and modifying our small reactor concept. And what we uh, show today is mostly more standard optimal experimental approaches for designing experiments and uh, identifying uh, kinetic constants. So part of the work that we've done is that uh, we started with a fixed bed model and uh, it's a standard heterogeneous model uh, where we simulate the fluid phase, the solid phase, the pressure drop. Uh, we assume a standard or we utilize actually data from a standard fixed bed reactors published in the literature that they are housed inside the furnace. So, so we assume a constant temperature at the wall and the uh, heat uh, transfer from the wall and due to exothermic or endothermic reactions. And we take into account all the diffusion effects inside the small particle. So what the chemical looping uh, uses is what we call an oxygen carrier. It's that metal that's being oxidized and reduced uh, in every step. Uh, even the pores of that change over time, and uh, we have studied that a little bit. And most importantly, uh, we have shown that for relatively larger particles, diffusion limitations, chemical looping are significant, so they have to be taken into account. And uh, to just to prove, and this is mostly the background of uh, the model of the models we have uh, themselves, is we actually utilized the, the data published from, uh, this is from a group in Canada, this is from a group in uh, Sweden, and this is from a group in, uh, group in uh, uh, Korea or Japan, where it's in, uh, in Japan, and um, chemical looping combustion with methane and nickel oxide, and this is chemical looping reforming, a slightly different concept where you also add water to produce hydrogen. And uh, with the same model, and uh, same kinetic constants, and same kinetic network, we actually simulated very accurately all the uh, experiments that were available. What you see here, a typical plot, is the gas concentration versus uh, time for a fixed bed uh, reactor. And this is, by definition, a transient uh, experiment where uh, you get uh, some uh, high CO2 in the beginning. And then, uh, because the nickel oxide is being reduced, we have other types of reactions that I will show later on. So what reactions are going on is, and I promise this to be the most chemical engineering aspect of my talk, is we have uh, oxygen carrier reduction reactions, so pretty much the reduction of nickel oxide by methane itself or by hydrogen that might be produced, uh, CO, or partial oxidation. And there is a whole list of uh, catalytic reactions, and nickel is known to be a very good catalyst for several uh, processes among which is hydrogen production and uh, through steel reforming, water gas shift, dry reforming, and also is known to be a catalyst that uh, is very prone to form carbon, which is a problem in chemical looping because you're forming carbon in one step, and then that carbon is going to the oxidation steps and produce carbon from the wrong reactor, uh, CO2 from the wrong reactor, so you don't capture that CO2. And uh, we did that one step further, and we simulated uh, TGA, thermogrammetric analysis, where you have a very, very small sample inside the crucible and you oxidize that and we, there is no real convection there, only uh, forced convection or temperatural convection. And uh, you simulate the uh, overall selectivity of the reaction, how it's termed diffusion, particle diffusion, uh, layer diffusion, and so on affect the selectivity. And this is an interesting study because we did all that and we, uh, this is impressed, we published that. Just to show that at least for our experiments, it's, everything is reaction controlled. It's not a diffusion and so on. But we have to come up or work with a more detailed model to, uh, to prove that. And at the same time, we work with, when you have a gas solid reaction, it's, uh, it's very uh, significant to understand how the gas is reacting with the solid. 
And there are several different theories and about 20 or 21 uh, kinetic models to describe that. And there is also a ton of information available in the literature on uh, how uh, the reaction, the reaction proceed, the reactions proceed. So what we did is uh, we actually analyzed all the available experimental data versus all the available uh, kinetic uh, models for um, uh, gas solid reactions. And we used uh, statistical analysis like the F-test and uh, IT information criterion to come up with uh, what the uh, model is uh, best. And this is actually an argument I'll make in the conclusions. We did that after we simulated all kinds of processes to just to prove that the model we're using was the second best, not the best. Uh, so what this shows is the volumetric model that assumes that everything's homogeneous throughout the particle or throughout the piece of the particle that's uh, 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 non-dense. And uh, this is uh, what is called the uh, Avrami uh, Erofer model that assumes that all the reactions start for a more small nuclei and they keep exp expanding by based on that. And the terms that are affecting the reactions are uh, the number of nuclei that the reactions start with and the, uh, the uh, rate of their growth. Uh, we back this up with uh, some experimentation from SEM analysis to XRD and we proved with statistical uh, confidence that this is the model that one should be working with. The second best model is A, the simple version, and most all of my data are uh, actually all of the results are with the simpler version. The two models are close enough, but statistically <coughs> this is more significant. So we are in the process of uh, updating many of the models using this funding. So when all my background is in modeling, I joined UConn, I realized I have no data, so we started setting up a few reactors. Uh, to verify things. This is a very standard small fixed bed uh, reactor for chemical looping. Uh, instead of having two reactors, when you have a small fixed bed, uh, in which you, you switch, we switch the, uh, the feed flow. So from air to the uh, fuel, back to the air, and so on. And we measure everything at the end with a, a mass spectrometer. And uh, uh, what we typically work with, because we had already all the models and so on, uh, is uh, we work with uh, nickel oxide on alumina, oxygen carrier, and uh, methane as our standard fuel, although we can do hydrogen and so on. So this is started focused on more on chemistry or uh, this started kinetics? to as a focus on chemistry and uh, mostly to verify the kinetic analysis and studies okay. that we have done before. Uh, but uh, we're taking a little bit further on uh, okay. the systems aspect of all this. Yeah. So a typical experiment looks like that. This is the oxidation step and this is the reduction step. And you get a lot of CO2 at some point and uh, during the reduction step, we actually over reduce it every time. So during the oxidation step, we also get uh, uh, CO. And um, uh, when you focus on, uh, say, we keep doing that, the reduction, oxidation, reduction, oxidation, reduction, oxidation, with a few steps of uh, perching, just uh, argon perching between. And if you focus just on one of the steps, it looks like that. You have a peak of uh, CO2 and then it drops down. Let me ask as a, as a novice, I don't know anything about this stuff, right? I thought the carbon monoxide is supposed to be bad, right? What do you say about carbon monoxide? So you should start at uh, where you, if you were not. Right. I see these peaks of uh, green things, right? Yeah, yeah. So this is not how you want to run a uh, chemical looping commercially. Uh, in our case, we, uh, the carbon formation reactions, especially with nickel, are very, very significant. So we want to study this and understand this very well, especially within the chemical looping uh, environment. So we formed, uh, we over, over reduced the uh, uh, nickel oxide to nickel, and then we have uh, carbon formation reactions. And these carbon reactions, when you flow through air, you burn the carbon and you produce CO. And you have a large excess of uh, uh, air, so it's uh, mostly uh, the, you don't have a large excess of fire in the beginning, so it's mostly CO, CO and then CO2. So that's a bad thing. It shouldn't happen in a commercial process. I'm pretty sure Austin doesn't run it like that. We run it like that intentionally because we want to study these reactions. We, and we want to understand it. So ideally, you would start every time here at the peak of CO2. You wouldn't have that at all. And you would uh, run it like that. So when we work with, uh, with, uh, with our experiments, the reactions that are not well understood in the chemical looping are the first four reactions, especially the oxidation, uh, the oxidation reactions of uh, nickel oxide with methane. Yeah. So in order to understand that we and how the conditions are affecting 
our measurements and our estimates of the kinetic constants, we uh, ran a dynamics and stability analysis taking the model, the fixed bed model that uh, we have, the heterogeneous one with uh, isos okay, with uh, uh, heat balance, and uh, we studied the sensitivity of the model with respect to the kinetic constant of each one of these parameters, of each one of these reactions. Four reactions for the oxidation of reduction of uh, nickel oxide uh, by methane, hydrogen, CO, or partial oxidation of methane. So, in this case, what we study only is the overall effect of the kinetic constant, and uh, at least the chemical is quite common that the kinetic constant has a pre exponential factor and activation energy, so it has it's a function of the temperature and the pre exponential factor at the same time. So, here we study the global effect. And by just looking at this, one could, uh, we use uh, standard local methods for uh, sensitivity analysis which generate the sensitivity matrix and then by just looking at this one could say that if I want to maximize the information that I get from an experiment using the uh, for the kinetic, uh, the kinetic constant of the first reaction I should run either very early or at the end so this is time and this is space and this is the normalized sensitivity so your best bet is to run the experiment right there but that's not the case for the experiment with, uh, with the normalized sensitivity of the second reaction, where your best bet is to run it very early. And this, these are quite new results. This is a very, very high sensitivity, so we're actually double-checking to see if this is um, correct or this is a numerical uh, error or something in the, right in the beginning. If I were to uh, run the experiment to identify the kinetic constant of the third reaction I should be running around here. And if I want to run the experiment to identify the kinetic constant of the fourth reaction, I should be running right here. So this should be very, very early in time and a very, very small reactor. Again, this is our, our own reactor. We can change the length, we can change the time of the experiment, we can identify each one of the reactions independently. What this shows is that this is not a trivial problem. This is not telling me that I should be running for long times all the time for to maximize the sensitivity of uh, uh, the four reaction, uh, reaction constants that I have, or I should be running at early times in small reactors. It's uh, all over the place. So if I want to actually maximize the sensitivity for all of them, I need to run uh, through an identifiability analysis and an overall optimal experimental design to design an experiment that will actually give me the information with a, a maximum statistical significance. So we ran through, we analyzed uh, structural local identifiability and structural global identifiability, which uh, in, in this case, and we mostly work with uh, fission information matrix uh, that includes the information from the experiments, the standard deviation of the experiment over the number of uh, experiments that we need to run and over the number of, uh, uh, over the time that we need to run, over the number of experimental uh, time steps that we need to run. Because uh, at the same time, there is this question that we can design the optimal experiment, but the real question is how many are optimal? Is it we need just one or do we need just two? And I'll discuss through that uh, uh, briefly. The overall concept of uh, CLI and CGI is that uh, one can uh, design the optimal experiment and at the same time do model discrimination. And in our case, because we have the 20 different kinetic models, we actually need to go through a step of model discrimination and understand and prove for the actual fixed bed, at least, what is the optimal, uh, the statistically significant model uh, for, for this analysis. Okay. The, the model you use? The model I use is the fixed bed model that I presented. That is the OD model or PD model? PD. PD model, okay. DA, PD. Uh, DAE, okay. And um, all this is solved in sequence. Sequence automatically uh, discretize everything for me, or I can discretize everything myself. And uh, the, the, the partial differential equations are converted into a system of dynamic algebraic equations, which solves that, uh, that problem. But, but the way you found the optimization problem is solved for optimal design, because you include the yield, the controls in it as well, right? Or initial controls. Do you what? solve for the controls? No. What do you mean? Optimization controls? problem. You solve for the optimal parameter for the design, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'll show the formulation for one simple example of the optimal experimental design yeah. in more detail later on. Right. Right. We use the optimal, we translate after that. Right. In this case, we just studied the uh, correlation matrix uh, for the Arrhenius parameter parameters. If you're 
Here comes near, this is very trivial. This is the parameterized uh, induced nice. expression for, uh, uh, for any reaction. And uh, so you have a KRF for the pre exponential factor and uh, an E, the activation energy. And these are the two unknowns. So we kind of trick the problem and say this, it's known that if you take the logarithm of uh, reaction rate and uh, you plot that versus uh, the uh, one over temperature, you get a linear line. And uh, you only need two points to uh, you get a line, and you only need two points to define the line if you eliminate, forget about experimental level coefficient. So we run uh, this through uh, SLI and uh, through uh, a definability analysis, and the objective is to ask the number of experiments that we need to run to identify both the pre-exponential factor and the activation energy. Beforehand, we know the answer. It's at least two. But uh, we want the model to tell us that that uh, does no kinetics or chemical engineering that way. So with, uh, when we run with just uh, one experiment, we get a very, very high correlation. Typically, it's actually one, because there is uh, uh, always an infinite number between KF and epsilon uh, and activation energy that uh, can give you the same overall kinetic constants for one temperature. And uh, when we run it and we let it free, for more than one experiment, it calculates that we need two experiments for the um, process to be identifiable. And this is uh, uh, identified by the much smaller uh, um, interrelation correlation matrix between uh, KEN1 and uh, the activation energy for reaction 1, and uh, the exponential factor for reaction 2, and the activation energy for reaction 2, and so on. Uh, when we run, ask if uh, three experiments are better, and I'm not showing, not showing here. Uh, the model tells us no, you just need two, because in principle it's just two points that define a line. And in principle, there is a way to transform this sort of whole problem into just a very simple linear problem. Uh, we'll start now playing with the actual experimental error that we introduced to the model to see if uh, the error actually will just start generating uh, different answers. So we take that, and what we have is a very detailed model for a fixed bed reactor in ZPROMs, and a uh, method to an uh, analyze statistically the significance of the parameters that we estimate. And uh, what we do is generate an overall uh, loop for between these two estimate parameters, estimate uh, the estimate parameters, design optimal experiments with these parameters, conduct the experiment in the small fixed bed reactor, and keep doing that until we have conversions between the model, what we model and what we measure. And um, because we're much better in modeling than experiments, this is the most time consuming step of the thing. And um, to design an experiment, we use um, the optimality criterion that uh, says that uh, if I take the determinant of the physical information matrix with respect to uh, five, the controls, uh, then uh, I can calculate uh, how I should be running my experiment in terms of, uh, in order to maximize the uh, significance or the evidence of what I want to see from the experiment, the information that the experiments produce. And what I show here, and we keep running experiments to verify this, what I present here is that uh, this is a baseline experiment. Typically, we run it as the literature recommends or as we think it's best. And this is what the optimal OED was suggesting for us to do. What it has actually asked us to do is keep the temperature the same, and change the flow rate of methane to, uh, to double to twice what it was. And the fit in both cases is very good. This is uh, the fit that the line is uh, published in the model, the points of the experiment for CO2, for methane, and for uh, carbon monoxide. So in both cases, you would say that these, these are actually fine models either way. But if you go and check on the 95% uh, uh, confidence intervals between the two experiments, the optimal experiment has sometimes 10 times lower uh, confidence intervals, normalized confidence intervals, which means that now we estimate uh, different kinetic constants compared to before, but with uh, much, much higher stat statistical uh, significance. So we have a model that's very accurate. We can design the experiments. We can optimize the experiments for uh, fixed bed. And we took it one step further to see if that model that's a dream for a chemical engineer. If I can use a fixed bed model, model to, uh, uh, to simulate a fluidized bed model. So in a fluidized bed model, typically in the standard bubbling bed uh, regime, I have bubbles uh, flowing up. And um, 
uh, carrying some solid with them. That solid uh, escapes when the bubble bursts at the top of the dense bed and uh, recirculates down. So a fluidized bed model is a very good uh, overall representation of a CSTR reactor, a continuous, a continuous fluid steel uh, tank reactor. Uh, there is a lot of equations, I'm not going to go through that. Uh, uh, describing this pretty much we have to take into account all the conversion and diffusion and dispersion effect in the uh, dense phase, all the diffusion between the bubble and the dense phase, all the diffusion between the bubble and what we call the wake, what the bubble carries with it, and uh, pressure energy balance for this and pressure balance for this as well. So we plug in our kinetics, and these kinetics are what it was the analysis from one of my students for all the reactors, some kind of global kinetics that we came up with. We plug in the kinetics, we plug in all the equations, we have a few uh, correlations that you can play with, mostly in identifying what is best for each of the reactors, and then we go ahead and uh, simulate, predict the performance of reactors from uh, several different groups. So this is again a group from Canada, this is a group from Sweden, and this is a group from uh, Austria or Sweden again. So this is a few predictions. You just plug in the numbers, you run the model, and you predict the performance of a fluidized bed reactor. This is very significant because, first of all, we can trust the model, and second, we can trust the kinetics. So, so for fluidized bed model, you still focus on the reaction kinetics? It's nickel oxide with methane and the reaction kinetics of a fixed bed and nothing okay. else. Solid and transport the... has not been considered so far. Hmm? Solid transport. Because uh, fluidized like bed so. solid transport is very important. Solid transport? Solid transport. Between what? No, between, between the reactors or within the reactor. So all this is in the, in the, in the fluidized bed mode. Okay. Uh, so okay. it is entrained with a bubble and is recirculated back. Okay. And at the same time, what is the entrainment from the dense phase, as we call it, okay. the fluidized bed to the uh, free, free board, the, okay. the zone above that, everything is in the mode. So, so it's so. coupled. Yeah. Solid transport and the reaction connection. So we just use a, uh, uh, this is the Cunningham River Spill uh, three phase model. But you don't know. We just reproduce that model and we plug in our kinetics and we did a lot of analysis with regards to okay. um, the effect of the bubble size or distributor right. size and so on. We have a paper that. But, but why didn't you include the momentum balance in this? Uh, it's there. It, uh, it's there. It's, it's, it's okay. there. Okay. It's there. I don't <laughs> have more space. I just look at the title. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we have a momentum balance and the energy balance. It's, uh, it's all right. Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> So, bottom line is that we have a, fluid, a fixed bed model that we did. It's definitely very accurate, and a fluid based bed model that's definitely very, very, very accurate because it predicts, it's, uh, it doesn't fit anything it predicts. So, we went ahead to see to compare the two concepts, like a fixed bed model where we change the uh, uh, flow, uh, where, where we change the flow between methane and, uh, and uh, air, and a fluid based bed model with two different reactor steps. And what we present here is just a reduction step that's the most challenging one where you have the, uh, all the catalytic reactions and the methane oxidation reactions. And uh, what we overall showed was that the fixed bed is not good at all. So which is what every, everyone knows in the chemical looping community. This is quite known. Uh, some of the problems is that the CO2 selectivity is not that high because it's a fixed bed and you have uh, a, a, a profile of reactions inside the reactor, whereas for the fluid based bed, CO2 selectivity is close to one if you run everything ideal with a, a much uh, a very high loading of uh, oxygen carrier. At the same time, the problem with uh, fixed bed is that the first part is being reduced, and I'll show that later on. You form a lot of carbon, and at the same time, uh, where the carbon formation in the fluid based bed is minimal, it's uh, almost non existent. So, what this analysis showed, and uh, overall as a background, we have uh, we are working with uh, chemical looping, and we explored uh, two options, fixed bed and fluidized bed reactors. And because uh, there are many major challenges with fluidized bed reactors, mostly including attrition, so the nickel oxide or any other oxygen carrier is actually fragmented and escapes with uh, spines. So we solved the CO2 problem and we introduced a serious nickel poisoning problem to the planet. And people, other people have worked with rotary beds and moving beds, like the LS Fund group from uh, Ohio okay. State. And uh, what we have done is focus more on fluid based bed and fixed bed to simulate the yeah. overall process. The so process options, also uh, calcium beds, we use actually fluid based bed, and the other one is transport re reactor. 
very high speed. Yeah, I, I don't have the transport reactors, I agree. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I don't have the transport reactors because that step is uh, specific to the calcium, actually. You cannot yeah, find yeah, that yeah, step yeah. in anything else. Yeah. And uh, so uh, we can trust our models. There are several different scenarios, and we have shown that fluidized bed reactors make, make much more sense. What is the problem with a fixed bed reactor, which will be a perfect uh, scenario, actually, a perfect case if we could run it uh, this way, because you don't have attrition, you have better reactor utilization, and you, it's a much smaller and easier to scale up. You can have a high pressure process in a fixed bed much easier, and so on. The problem is this is how one experiment, the simulation of one experiment, looks like inside the uh, reactor. So this is the normalized bed height, and this is time. What happens is it's a fixed bed when you have uh, one uh, flow, then everything uh, flows from this uh, side. The nickel oxide is being reduced and being reduced and being reduced. Eventually, at higher times, you have all the first part of the reactor being entirely uh, reduced. And this is now pure nickel that catalyzes all the other reactions. Whereas this part of the reaction is still, uh, this part of the reactor is still active and can still do chemical looping. But the feed first went through that and was. Uh, uh, has gone through all the catalytic reactions that most of them are actually unwound. So if the problem is mixing, and that's the advantage, the real advantage of a fluidized bed reactor, one can mix things in a fixed bed reactor by reversing the flow. So instead of flowing from the same direction all the time, we come up with an idea that you could actually reverse the flow every now and then, and then instead of having this profile, have a profile that looks like that from, from both sides of the reactor. Reverse flow reactors are nothing new. They're common in uh, reforming and uh, not very common, but uh, they exist in uh, reforming and they exist for uh, a list of uh, chemical, uh, chemical engineering applications. So what this shows is pretty much the same concept. Uh, uh, we switch between uh, air and methane with a small step of carbon if needed, and this is for the laboratory reactor. And we uh, reverse the flow using two valves and actuators. So uh, for half of the reduction step, everything flows this way. And then we switch the flow, and everything flows this way. The products are collected at the exact same position, and, uh, and the, the rest of the process is the same. So that was the idea. And unfortunately, the idea didn't come from a model. It came from a person, <laughs> me. But uh, the uh, the concept is, uh, if we analyze that with our existing models, and if, if we can actually show how it performs from, compared to uh, standard uh, This actually evolved into a provisional patent that uh, has a whole list of claims and the language that I don't, understand, I don't understand anymore because it's lawyer's language. But what we say is that we address every single uh, problem that the fluidized bed reactor has by definition, because it's fluidized, it was, uh, 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 crash the, the particles and uh, because uh, you have to separate gases in, uh, between the two reactors and so on. And at the same time, it addresses all the disadvantages of the fixed bed reactor. What I will show today is mostly how we address all the disadvantages of a fixed bed reactor. Mostly the lower CO2 selectivity and the uh, temperature uh, fluctuation inside the bed. So we took our original model, but now we have a slightly different problem. We don't have an isothermal problem, or the reactor is not inside the furnace. It's actually um, um, adiabatic or close to adiabatic because we're trying to simulate a real process now, a hypothetical commercial process. And uh, so, and at the same time, we don't have diluted gases as we have when we do an experiment. It's complete 100% methane feed because this is how a real commercial plant would operate. It wouldn't dilute the gas with anything. And so we have to switch to a dusty gas model for uh, concentrated transport uh, uh, modeling and time uh, varying boundary conditions to represent the switch. So uh, this is similar to our standard uh, heterogeneous model for a fixed bed reactor. And the major uh, differences in the boundary conditions that are uh, changing with uh, time. So what we did, we studied several different time steps for when you should switch the flow during the same reduction uh, step. How, how do you, yes. 
How do you handle that time very boundary condition in the model? So this is it. There are several ways. The first okay. time I had I come up with the idea, I did it in MATLAB and I was switching the reactor instead of the boundary condition. Yeah. So I would take all the states of the reactors and uh, reactor and uh, uh, transpose them, which is not really realistic. Now Lou is doing it by just applying a, a, boundary, a binary change in boundary conditions between the two states. Okay. And you will see how this affects the, uh, the results uh, very much. So what we did is, okay, we want to switch the flow every now and then. We don't know exactly how often, and uh, we don't know even the time of the experiment. What we did, first of all, was design a representative average fixed bed reactor out of all the fixed bed reactors that exist in the literature. Uh, something that's relatively large enough to show the effect, something that we can uh, work with as adiabatic, and then we took that and we said that what you see every time as a black line is how that reactor operates in standard conditions in, uh, as it is supposed to operate. And what you see is the blue line or the green line or the red line is if uh, the detection step of that uh, reactor for a switch that uh, every 30 seconds, every 40 seconds or every 20 seconds. Uh, this, what we uh, have on this side is the CO2 selectivity as it comes out of the reactor. So what you see when the blue line is much higher than the black line, that's, that's good. Uh, uh, it drops down, and you see these lines, because every time you switch, it spits out the methane that's right on the uh, entrance of the previous step. So it gives back some of the methane, but this is very tiny, a very small uh, concentration. And so we are here, we switch. Uh, for, for a second, it spits out some methane and comes up. And it's not a second, actually. It's a microsecond or something and uh, keeps doing the same reaction, but on uh, the, the inverse. And by analyzing several different reaction steps, we came up with, uh, for this reactor design at least, uh, that the optimal is 30 seconds to switch between cycles. And if we compare the two reactors, it's, uh, when we talk about CO2 capture, we're only interested in numbers that are higher than 90%, uh, CO2 capture efficiency or selectivity. So for a one directional, we need to use to switch when the oxygen carrier conversion is about 0.3, whereas for the uh, reverse flow, we can switch when the oxygen carrier conversion is about 0.6. So we kind of improved double the uh, utilization or uh, efficiency of the reactor itself. We did that for a bench scale reactor, and then I took that the reactor and scaled it up to an industrial equivalent. I'll briefly discuss about the scale up process. And we showed that actually for our hypothetical industrial scale reactor, the results are even better. The CO2 capture efficiency or the uh, oxygen carrier utilization is even higher. So in this case, we didn't really optimize the reactor for reverse flow. The objective here is to keep the settings of the fixed bed and start, uh, have an apples to apples comparison, just that. So how does it look from uh, uh, inside? If you think about it, if everything was uh, perfectly mixed, this is time and this is bed height. Uh, if everything is perfectly mixed, as it's almost uh, like that in a fluid as bed reactor, there is no bed height variation. Everything moves just with time, and these are vertical lines. In a fixed bed reactor, you have variation with bed height and time. So it uh, generates an angle like that. So by reversing the flow, we take this angle and we kind of make it relatively vertical. So we kind of represent this good mixing, not because there is mixing inside of the solid, but mostly because we switch the gas between the entrance and the exit. And this is for the exit at Zankaria conversion. This is how the temperature profile looks like. It's much more uniform. And what you do with the reverse flow is actually have a very hot temperature front right at the center of the reactor, which is good also for the thermodynamic limitation of that. And the nature of one that doesn't show here very well is that you don't form carbon anymore, or you form much lower carbon because there is lower nickel oxide, nickel available in the reactor when methane flows through it. So if we compare uh, carbon versus oxygen carrier conversion for the uh, reverse flow and uh, the one direction, we have more than half of the carbon formed in the one direction at the uh, higher oxygen carrier conversion. At the same time, we have an overall lower, smaller temperature uh, fluctuation of temperature drop. So if you study just the maximum temperature drop inside the bed, you'll find that there is a 50C improvement with a reverse flow constant. 
So we took that and we scaled it up. To scale it up, we took a, com a commercially realistic industrial scale. Because we work with a heterogeneous model and we've shown that um, overall uh, larger particles introduce diffusion limitations, we work with a smaller particle. This actually introduces uh, constraint in the bed height. We scaled up the reactor by scaling and uh, using scaling factors, the L to D ratio, height to diameter ratio, and the fruit number. And we came up with a reactor that has approximately the uh, same fruit number, but it's five times larger. No, more than five times larger. I don't have the volume here, but uh, it's significantly larger. And we also did the same analysis, and we showed that for the very for the commercial reactor, uh, we can have a much uh, uh, high, we need a much higher switch rate for smaller uh, time between uh, switching or reversing the flow of uh, five five seconds, and the overall benefits from doing that are actually a little bit higher. So this is again the CO2 selectivity versus options and guided conversion, and can be up to 90% at uh, point, up to 9% at 0.5 or 0.6, 6% uh, of the guided conversion. And actually, that's the number of fluidized bed. So we match the uh, performance of fluidized bed, but we have another work going on on actually comparing fluidized beds with fixed beds. So how does it look from the inside? In the, from the inside, uh, this is again the one directional. This is the reverse flow for oxygen carrier conversion, temperature profile, carbon formation, and uh, uh, solid carbon selectivity. And in all aspects, it's very very similar to how the smaller reactor looked like. Uh, more vertical lines and more uniform profiles everywhere. Uh, very very big advantage in terms of uh, carbon formation at higher oxygen carrier conversions and about 50 C temperature difference again. Uh, so overall, uh, first of all, to relate it a little bit to the model design aspect, the uh, model-based development aspects of uh, the institute, what we should have done is start with a statistical analysis, which was the first, uh, the fourth step of what we did, then uh, develop the fixed bed model, then do the optimal experiment design to verify how the fixed model uh, would look like, uh, should be, and what are the constants and parameters there, then do a fluidized bed model, a prediction and validation as we did, then compare the two, and then come up with the idea of the first flow of the actor. What we actually did is start from the fixed bed model, then we went to the fluidized bed model, then we went to the optimal experimental design, then we went to the comparison, then we went to the statistical analysis, and, and this actually generates about a three to six months delay in updating everything. Well, not really delay, but uh, we're not as efficient as, as, as um, we could have been. And this is a nice structural approach to address any problem, and purely the CI is deficiency in not addressing it like that. How, how do you do the first thing when, when you're doing some new new system? So what we did first is we, we didn't have the reactor. Uh, it's one of, one of my students took all the literature data on fixed bed models, and we simulated using a standard fixed bed uh, a pseudo-homogeneous model for, for the reactor. So we had the basis very early on, like um, three months or six months after we started the project, we had, we had a decent basis. The model has been improved and has been much more fundamental since then, but the actual predictions are not that much better. We actually, uh, in the heterogeneous model, when we published that, we were comparing that to all kinds of other uh, models of uh, different fidelity. And there are differences, it's better, but it's not that the other model is useless. So you could have done just that, start with a fixed bed model, and then go directly to the statistical analysis, because you don't need much more than that. And what we have accomplished so far, even with our deficiencies and, and uh, wrong steps, is an overreactor concept that we invented and actually addresses major uh, roadblocks in the commercialization of existing chemical looping plants. And this major roadblock is the cost of the oxygen carrier, which is huge or very significant anyway in chemical looping, the attrition and the pollution that this may generate depending on the oxygen carrier that one uses, uh, the separation steps that are quite expensive and challenging and, uh, for the fluidized beds because of two separate reactors. And at the same time, we came up with a reactor concept that uh, is much, much better compared to, the, uh, uh, to a standard fixed bed. So our aim, and what you write in the first page of an proposal, is actually to put chemical looping in a new learning curve where you 
relax all the limitations or requirements for, uh, for fluid ice bed and uh, make it a disruptive, disruptive technology much, much faster compared because it's a fixed bed reactor. It's easy. It's similar to how reforming reactors operate. It's easy to scale up. It's a smaller problem. Uh, before I finish, I'd like to acknowledge the NSF Career Award, which actually funded all this study until now. Uh, uh, with the patent, we were lucky enough to get the Yukon prototype fund, so we actually built the uh, building or plan on building the uh, reactor that we estimated to be so much better uh, right now, because it would be nice to add a few experimental points in all these claims. And uh, students, two students, graduate students who did all that, Siguan Zhu and Nu Han, Siguan uh, uh, mostly did the fluid aspect modeling, the dynamic parameter estimation, and the statistical analysis, whereas Lu is working on the PG prompts, systemic analysis, optimal experimental design, and the probability analysis, and so on. And a whole list of uh, uh, undergraduate students, Ari Fisher and Oscar, some of them are here. Uh, Catherine Sue, who's working on uh, materials preparation. Uh, Carl Salz, who, uh, Salz, who worked with uh, Lou on uh, G-Proms on the reverse flow reactor, uh, running several different uh, cases. And, and Clark, who's a new student, who uh, started working on this with, uh, with Lou. So with that, I thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer your questions.